Thanks, Carol, for giving us a little time today. You and I both know that the single most effective thing we can do to streamline the source selection process is to make better choices of evaluation factors. That's right. Since everyone seems to struggle with the question of how to make the best choice of evaluation factors for their particular acquisition using trade-off, I thought it would be a good idea to get involved with the requiring activity early and try to help them before they even begin to draft a source selection plan. That is why I asked Major Torres, who will probably be the Source Selection Evaluation Board Chair for this upcoming acquisition, to join us today. When Jack said he wanted to talk about streamlining what is about to become my major job, I said count me in. I think that's a great idea. We could talk about some of the basic concepts that should be applied when selecting evaluation factors. Jack, I wish more contracting officers would take such a proactive approach to source selection. I often find myself reminding 1102s that the FAR empowers the contracting professional with significant responsibility for the proper execution, management, and oversight of the source selection process. How can I help? I'd like to go over some of the basic concepts involved in selecting evaluation factors, but I'm not sure where to start. Please start very basic because this is all new to me. Okay, I guess we should start by defining what an evaluation factor is. Evaluation factors are the subject matter areas that the government is going to evaluate. In other words, the evaluation factors are what we are going to evaluate. Yes, and what we are going to evaluate should always relate to and reflect those aspects of the government's requirement that are essential considerations for making the source selection decision. Having established that definition, I guess the next concept to emphasize is that, when selecting factors, more is not better. Having too many evaluation factors tends to dilute the government's ability to discriminate between competing proposals. It also will increase the paperwork, time, and cost of a source selection for both industry and government with little likelihood of improving the source selection decision. In fact, all that additional paperwork and time simply increases the chances for evaluation mistakes that may provide an unsuccessful offer of grounds for a protest. Yes, more is not better is definitely a good rule of thumb. Let's look at an example to illustrate why more is not better. In this example, three evaluation factors have been identified for the acquisition of System X. Technical, past performance, and price. Under the technical factor, five sub-factors have been identified. And under each of those five sub-factors, numerous elements have also been identified. This evaluation team thinks they are doing a good job in being very thorough in their selection of evaluation factors. But let's see what happens when we look at some potential results on the next two slides. Suppose this is what the evaluation results look like for one offerer in the technical factor. Assume the blue represents an outstanding rating and the green represents an acceptable rating. Notice that out of 22 elements being evaluated, eight are rated outstanding. And notice also that, although there are outstanding elements under every subfactor, when the ratings are rolled up to the subfactor level, there's only one subfactor that is rated as outstanding. Now notice that when the five subfactors are rolled up to a factor rating, it is only acceptable. Now suppose we have a second offerer who is given these ratings in that same technical factor. As before, the green represents a rating of acceptable, and here, the yellow represents a rating of marginal. This time, out of 22 elements being evaluated, 8 are rated marginal. And notice that, although there are marginal elements under every subfactor, when the ratings are rolled up to the subfactor level, there is only one subfactor that retains the marginal rating. Now notice that when the five subfactors are rolled up to a factor rating, it is again acceptable. So you can see in this simple example how the substantial differences in merit, 
outstanding versus marginal tend to get diluted or even lost altogether if there are too many aspects being evaluated which are not true discriminators. The result is that it is harder for the SSA to pick out the significant differences between the competing proposals. This is especially true as the ratings get rolled up to higher levels. In this example, the visibility of the discrimination between offerers is lost altogether at the factor level, where both offerers are rated the same in the technical factor, and clearly not as obvious at the sub-factor level. I think the next concept is probably the most crucial one to understand for good factor selection. The evaluation factors selected must be determinant, not just important. In other words, the factors must be subject matter areas which are likely to reveal substantive differences among competing proposals in terms of technical approach, levels of risk, or cost to the government. Absolutely correct. We should only be choosing evaluation factors that are discriminators. Without the ability to discriminate among competing proposals, the government will not be able to make an intelligent and well-informed decision on who wins the contract award. Selecting the correct evaluation factors and sub-factors is the most important decision in the evaluation process. Can you give me some examples illustrating how something can be important? It may not be determinant? Well, suppose the government intends to buy some system hardware, and suppose the design of a particular component of that system is very important to the performance of the system. However, suppose the technology and design of that component is quite commonplace in the industry, and there is a very high probability that every offerer will design it the same way. Or suppose that the government is going to require the successful offerer to build that component using detailed engineering drawings or specifications supplied by the government. Under either of these two scenarios, using the design of the component as an evaluation factor may serve no useful purpose. It will not provide an effective means to discriminate among competing offerers. That's a good example. The design of the component is certainly important, but it may not be a good discriminator for source selection purposes. Yes, and if this design factor carried a lot of importance or weight in the evaluation scheme relative to other evaluation factors, it may even dilute the effect of those other evaluation factors. Have you got another example? Okay. Suppose the government intends to buy some training services to support a particular weapon system. Suppose the government intends to use a set of detailed requirements specifying how much training, what kind of training, and when the training is to be provided. The approach an offerer is going to use to provide the training is always very important. However, under these circumstances, to use training approach as an evaluation factor may serve no useful purpose. It will not provide an effective means to discriminate among competing proposals because all offerers will follow the same detailed approach called for in the government specification. Thank you. Those are good examples of subject matter areas that are not good discriminators. Could you give me an example of one that would be a good discriminator? Sure. Let's just change the facts in the two examples I just gave you. Suppose that hardware component is not one that is commonplace in the industry and the government does not have detailed design drawings for the component. Under this set of circumstances, the design of the component may well be a good discriminator. This may especially be true if the purpose of the acquisition is to push the state of the art or increase the level of performance of the hardware and this component is critical to achieving that goal. Here, the design of the component is a subject matter area that is likely to reveal substantive differences in technical approach and levels of risk among competing offerers. Okay, I see the difference. And with respect to the training services to support the weapon system, suppose the government does not have detailed requirements for how the training should be done. In fact, Suppose the purpose of the acquisition 
is to try to find the most effective and cost-efficient method of training for this weapon system. Under this set of circumstances, the offeror's training approach may very well be a good discriminator. Each offeror may propose training approaches that reveal substantive differences in terms of effectiveness and efficiency. I think I'm beginning to understand. So, can you discuss how we know a good discriminator when we see one? First, it is important to recognize, as I think you already have, that selection of the evaluation factors must be a team effort because proposal evaluation and source selection involve disciplines other than just technical. Yes. In my mind, the primary responsibility on the team will lie with the cognizant technical personnel from the requiring activity, but the contracting officer and a representative from the legal office are also essential members of the team. I also think it's a good idea to include user representation on this team. Personnel from other functional elements, such as pricing, logistics, etc., can be called upon to participate as needed. Correct. This team of individuals should invest time up front to gain a basic understanding of some primary considerations, such as the system, item, or service being acquired, the specification, statement of work, or work breakdown structure of the system, item, or service being acquired, the mission need that the government is trying to satisfy, the stage of development of the system or item to be acquired, the major problems or high-risk areas anticipated during contract performance, the technical and procurement objectives the government is trying to achieve, market research results and industry input from any draft solicitations, lessons learned from similar previous acquisitions, and any budget constraints affecting the acquisition. These are the type of considerations that should be the most helpful in deciding what subject matter areas will be the best discriminators. I think a good litmus test of a true discriminator is to ask three questions. First, is this a subject matter area where the government has a reasonable expectation of variance among the offerers? If the answer is yes, is the expected variance measurable either quantitatively or qualitatively? If the answer here is also yes, is the measured variance something that may be worthy of paying a price or a cost premium for? If you can answer yes to all three questions, you probably have a pretty good discriminator to use as an evaluation factor. I like the litmus test concept. Yes, and those three questions can facilitate a really good discussion of what evaluation factors will work best for a particular acquisition. There is another good concept that we should emphasize when selecting evaluation factors. The government does not always have to evaluate every aspect of the requirement for example, every single paragraph of the statement of work or the specification. Remember that signing the contract creates a legal obligation on the part of the contractor to comply with all contract requirements. In other words, every paragraph of the statement of work or the specification does not need to be evaluated to be binding on both parties. This concept goes hand in hand with the concept of discriminators. Not evaluating a particular requirement does not mean the requirement is not important and the contractor does not have to comply with it. It simply means that the government has decided that it is not a good discriminator for source selection purposes. That's a good point, Carol. But we also have to remind everyone that your concept assumes the government has done a good job specifying its requirements. You are absolutely correct. For this concept to work, the government must make sure that it has clearly and accurately described all of its requirements in the statement of work, specification, or solicitation. But defining requirements is a topic for another day. I agree. So let me move on to something that has always puzzled me. FAR 15.304A says, Evaluation factors and sub-factors are supposed to be 
tailored to the acquisition. FAR 15.304C says that the evaluation factors and subfactors to be applied to an acquisition are within the broad discretion of agency acquisition officials. But then, after telling us that we have broad discretion to tailor our selection of evaluation factors for a particular acquisition, FAR 15.304C goes on to say that the selection is subject to the following requirements and describes a whole series of mandatory evaluation factors. So how much discretion does one really have to tailor the selection of evaluation factors? That language does seem contradictory, doesn't it? That's a great question. It is true that FAR 15.304C establishes four subject matter areas that are required to be evaluated in most acquisitions. They are price or cost, quality of the product or service, past performance, and small business participation. But these four subject matter areas are pretty broad. If we look at each one separately, I think you will see that there is still a lot of discretion and tailoring to be applied to each one. Good idea. Let's do that. First, we have FAR 15.304C1, which requires that we evaluate price or cost to the government in every source selection. That seems pretty obvious. You would always want to consider how much something is going to cost before you actually buy it. That is true. But what must be tailored to the unique circumstances of each acquisition is how you are going to evaluate what a particular proposal will cost the government. For example, is the contract going to be a fixed price contract or a cost reimbursement contract? Is the government buying a definite quantity of supplies or services so that the total cost to purchase should be fairly straightforward to figure out? Or is the government buying an indefinite quantity? which makes the total cost to purchase much more difficult to figure out. The answers to questions like these should absolutely affect the specific details of how you are going to evaluate price or cost to the government on a particular acquisition. That makes sense. I would think there are other variables to consider also, such as whether there are options included or how the government wants to evaluate incentive-type contracts. So there is a lot of room for tailoring here. That's right. And now moving on to the next mandatory subject matter area we have to evaluate, we have FAR 15.304C2, which says, The quality of the product or service shall be addressed in every source selection through consideration of one or more non-cost evaluation factors, such as past performance, compliance with solicitation requirements, technical excellence, management capability, personnel qualifications, and prior experience. Wow! Based on that language in the FAR, this quality of the product or service factor is potentially a pretty broad subject matter area. It sure is. This is where the most amount of tailoring and discretion has to be applied to find the true discriminators. Those subject matter areas that are related to and are likely to reveal substantive differences in the quality of the product or service being proposed. I also want to point out to you that the mandatory DOD source selection procedures, published in March of 2011, uses the term technical to refer to all non-cost factors other than past performance, regardless of what you actually title them in the source selection plan. Okay, so according to the DOD source selection procedures, we could call any factor or sub-factor addressing the quality of the product or service, except for past performance, a technical factor or sub-factor, right? That's correct. And speaking of past performance, that brings us to the next mandatory subject matter area that we have to evaluate. FAR 15.304C3 requires past performance to be evaluated in all acquisitions exceeding the simplified acquisition threshold, which is currently $150,000. 
unless the contracting officer documents the reason past performance is not an appropriate evaluation factor for that particular acquisition. Is there room for the application of discretion and tailoring in the past performance evaluation factor? Absolutely. You can tailor the definition of what type of past performance information is most relevant to the evaluation because this is the only information you should want to gather and evaluate. You can tailor how you want to gather the relevant information. For example, do you want to use questionnaires, direct contact with knowledgeable individuals, searches of existing databases, or some combination of these? Sounds like there is plenty of room for tailoring in the past performance factor. Yes. You could even choose not to evaluate past performance if the contracting officer documents, in accordance with FAR 15.304C, 3, that past performance is not an appropriate evaluation factor. Yes, that's right. Now let's look at the fourth mandatory subject matter area we have to evaluate. FAR 15.304C, 4 requires the extent of participation of small disadvantaged businesses and the performance of the contract to be evaluated in unrestricted acquisitions expected to exceed $650,000. The Department of Defense has expanded this at DFARS 215.304 to include the evaluation of the extent of participation of small businesses and historically black colleges or universities and minority institutions also. This is simply an evaluation of the extent to which the offerers identify and commit to using small businesses, historically black colleges or universities, and minority institutions in the performance of the contract. Well, that one seems pretty clear and concise. Doesn't appear to be a lot of room for tailoring here. No, there isn't. Since we have all these mandatory subject matter areas that we have to evaluate, do you have any suggestions for how to get a team started with selecting its evaluation factors? Yes, I do. I like to use a logical thought process I call the baseline plus approach. Start with a baseline of three required factors, price cost, past performance, and small business participation. Then consider what you may need to evaluate to adequately address the quality of the product or service. Remember, as stated in the FAR language we have already looked at, past performance is one of the ways to address quality. Since past performance is already in the baseline, that baseline actually addresses all the required subject matter areas of evaluation. So you can stop there, or you only need to add those additional subject matter areas that will truly serve as discriminators with respect to the particular product or service being purchased. That's the plus in the approach. That's a pretty simple approach. I like it. Can you describe what's the best way to figure out what plus to add to the baseline? A good place to start your brainstorming is by talking about and identifying the perceived contract performance risks anticipated by the government for the acquisition. Mitigation of those risks should be the crucial areas driving the selection and tailoring of the evaluation factors. This brainstorming should be done by that same multifunctional team you mentioned earlier. A team consisting of representatives from the program or item manager, user, support functions, acquisition center, legal, and any other appropriate functional expertise. Next, determine which of these crucial areas are discriminators. In other words, which ones have the potential to reveal substantive differences between competing offerers? Finally, you want to prioritize the list of potential discriminators to select the most decisive and critical ones. This prioritization should be done with full consideration of the essential aspects of the acquisition program, such as whether it is a development or production acquisition, what are the major areas of risk or uncertainty, such as software development, production capacity, or quality control? And what is the acquisition strategy and planned contract structure? Remember, you only want to plus up the baseline with those factors or sub-factors which you feel will effectively contribute to and facilitate 
the SSA's ability to distinguish one offerer from another. This has been great. You've given me some good ideas regarding how I can help our acquisition teams and requiring activities do a better job of selecting evaluation factors. Thank you very much. You both have given me a much better understanding of what it means to select evaluation factors. It definitely requires a lot of homework and a lot of thought by a lot of people early on in the acquisition cycle. Thanks for the education.